Hi, I'm Michelle Ward. As a mom, I've looked my children in the eyes with love and hoped I can lead them toward a bright, wonderful future. But as a neurocriminologist who's been studying violent crime for the last 20 years, I've also quietly hoped that at the very least, I'm not raising a future serial killer. And if you can relate to that taboo thought, congratulations, you've just found your new favorite podcast. This is How Not to Raise a Serial Killer. Hi, Beth. How are you? Hi, how are you? I'm well. I'm so happy. I've not seen you in real life in a lot of years, and I'm so happy that you're willing to come on and talk to me today about vampires. I know. It's super exciting. It's so bizarre. Vampire life. (laughs) Um, Beth has two children and lives in the South, where a lot of the vampires live, and one of her children is a teenager. One of her children? Yes. Only one. As a teenager. So you are going to be able to provide an interesting perspective to this very interesting story. This particular man, his name is Rod Farrell, and he is a self-proclaimed vampire, which at first made me laugh and then it really quickly didn't make me laugh. So I'm going to kind of, I, I interviewed this man myself for a um, TV show I used to host and produce called the mind of a murderer. And this was uh, an interview that I really had a hard time preparing for because I had never met a vampire. You know, I've met a lot of people, a lot of killers, but not a vampire. So I'm going to kind of walk you through his story, but a little bit about what it was like to meet with a vampire. I remember driving to the Tomoka prison and going through security with all of our film gear. And I walk into the interview room and it was so different from the normal prison interview rooms I'm accustomed to. It looked like a classroom. And actually I think it it was a classroom. And the interview table was this ridiculously long table with chairs set up on the opposite ends. I'm like, why? super awkward for a TV interview. And so I ask, and one of the producers is like, Michelle, he's a vampire and has literally sucked people's blood. And that was before he started killing people. So I'm laughing, I'm like, I got this. So anyway, I changed out the table. So now we're still at an awkward table, but it's not, you know, 20 feet apart. And like I said, I've never interviewed a vampire before. So in the in the show, you can see I'm nervous. And I had been doing this for years by then. And, but I'm like, <laughs> hi. <laughs> And you can see it all over my face in the episode. I actually look frightened. But then he walks in and he's coy and smiling like we're meeting for a date. And we're pretty close to the same age. He's nice and calm. He hardly summons the images of Bella Lugosi. I mean, he's he doesn't look like I expect. But nevertheless, he's done some very scary things. And I need to remember that. So for as many vicious murders as I have met, it's the guys like this who bring down my guard and they frighten me later. Okay, so what happened? Why is this guy a vampire? Well, unbeknownst to me, until I dove into this case, vampire covens are all over the United States. Nearly every major city and not so major city has one. And who knew? And they literally do vampire things like legitimate bloodletting orgies. But typically they don't kill people. And in many ways, this is a cautionary parenting tale. It's the scenario that you drum up in your head when your rebellious teenage daughter starts hanging out with, in my case in high school, was the back parking lot guys and the combat boots and the trench coats and smoking marble reds. But you know that that whole underbelly, that that seedy, dark teenage group, when your daughter starts hanging out with that, you're not thinking vampire, but you know bad shit's going down in that group. Let's talk about one specific vampire. His name's Rod Farrell, and he was born in Florida in 1980 to a teenage mom named Sandra Gibson. 
because she was a young mom, she didn't have a lot of financial security. They bounced back and forth between trailer parks, small apartments, I think maybe even living with friends. And we interviewed her and we talked to her at length. And she said that Rod was a really quiet child growing up. He had very few friends. He was musically inclined, always into drawing, but a loner, like, you know, didn't didn't have peers. And Rod tells me that he knew he was different from other kids from a very young age. And he tried really hard to sound humble when he said this, but he admits that he believed he was smarter than his peers, even as a young child, and that he could see things differently. He saw things like an adult. And then he goes on to tell me that he was more intelligent than all the people around him. That's who we start with, right? We start with a child with a very um, inflated sense of self. But as a teenager, Rod started becoming dark. He was fascinated with macabre. His mom tells us that she saw the stark change at 15 years old, but I suspect it happened even earlier than that. Um, his whole look changed. Jewelry, just got into witchcraft, started dressing in all black, the whole persona. And he started spending the night in cemeteries because that's normal. Yeah, that's very, te- I feel like that's a very like dark teenage thing to do. Oh, you did it. I see. No, I didn't do it, but I just feel like... <laughs> Beth was hooking up with vampires. No, never. No, I was not. So at this point... Rod is spending the evenings in cemeteries, and he began to claim that he was a 500-year-old vampire named Visago. And he he didn't do this like a schizophrenic would do it. He's not talking to himself and imagining this world. He's like, oh, hi, I'm, I'm Visago, and this is my situation. So it was a persona that he adopted and at some point was delusional enough to believe, but also convinced other people it was true. It's kind of funny that He chose such an interesting name and not, like, Gary. Gary the Vampire. But as Rod tells me, it wasn't actually that unusual at the time. And he reminds me that this is when the Anne Rice books were all the rage. Interview with the Vampire had just come out. And he says that was an allure to a lot of people. So I asked him, I said, do you know the difference at this point between reality and fantasy? And he says he did at this time, but he doesn't always. As it goes on, he he loses that distinction. And he talked about it being kind of a spiritual path for him that could lead to possibly a physical manifestation. That's a moment I want us to pay attention to because as small children, we quite happily blur the lines between fantasy and reality. And when you're digging in your backyard for treasure, there's some suspension of disbelief. It really could be true. You're not sure because so much of our lives when we're children is fantasy. As your brain matures, you start delineating facts from fantasy, but that can be really disappointing because you lose the magic. So I think some kids, and we kind of all knew them growing up, they they held on to that longer. And these kids are 14, 15 at the time. And I don't think they had the brain capacity to true. I think they know if they're sitting there and thinking about it, that this is fantasy, but they're just immature enough to suspend it for a minute. So Rod's mom says he started going to Orlando. He's driving up to Orlando and he's going to the clubs. And they were letting these young teens into these clubs and there were orgies and drugs and he would come back wild, she said. Okay, so he's obviously not the first teenager to do drugs and have sex, obvi, but he tells me that it was the vampirism that drew him to these places. And he said, it's like sex. And when you drink the blood directly from someone's vein while it's still hot, it's a sexual release. So he's not just going to clubs like you would picture, you know, a teenager breaking into clubs. He's going to specific places where they can act out these vampire rituals. He tells me that it is very organized and that the rituals themselves have rules that they follow. There's somebody who's dominant, there's submissive partners, and in the bloodletting, that's particularly true. So there are some people who like to give the blood and some people who like to receive the blood. And it does sound very sexual. Submission and dominance does exist. He says that it's just like a step above that. He said... I started to believe at the time that if you found a way to awaken that life inside your blood, 
then you could help awaken the next person, almost like infectious, only with knowledge and understanding. And that's when he says, maybe leading to physical manifestation of power. He said, you know, it's super seductive and it's sexy. And I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, okay, yes, but you're a teenager. So I think he also liked it because vampires are dark and scary and it's super rebellious. Like teens push the limits and they push the envelope and they want to be more different than the next one. Rod ends up with his own coven, his own vampire family, and he is the leader. He has underlings. And he abides by all these rules and this hierarchy, and so do they. Listeners, you might be wondering, where's the mom in all of this? Well, things get super weird here, too. So she was super close to Rod, and there were definitely boundary issues. They, by both of their accounts, they were more like best friends and... A neighbor who was interviewed reported that they would see them walking hand in hand like a couple, both dressed in black. But she was only a teenager when she became a mom. So she was probably, I mean, what is she, 30 when this is happening? 32? Like, she's really young. According to Rod, I summoned the vision of Mean Girls, the cool mom in this part. But he was like, she really identified with my group, my friends, and my interests, like the vampirism. I, she did not say that she was into vampirism, but she definitely was more into the counterculture stuff like he was. But with that came no boundaries, no discipline. And, you know, in, when I first interviewed them, I, I said something about emotional incest, which I don't know that I necessarily believe is true now, but it definitely was not a standard I don't think there was anything creepy going on, but it wasn't a standard mom-son relationship. And I think that's because of how close they were in age. And also like her wanting to be his friend more than his parent. Kids like boundaries. They need they structure. Know they do. Yeah, they do. They need the structure. But you have a teenage daughter and it's like, it's hard. Yes. I mean, she's newly teenage. I th- she's 14, but I think that um, she's on the flip side of this kind of vampire culture where she's really wants like normalcy and to be normal and not stand out. But I can see how for a teenager, these kind of cults are so alluring. If you are like an outsider or a lone, a lone wolf, you can get into it on your own with the internet, especially if you live in a rural culture where there's not a lot of outlets. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of find friends that way. And I feel like if a parent's asleep at the wheel, you can really, lose a sense of what your teen is into or up to or yeah. I mean, you kind of always want your kids bringing their friends over to your house. You know who their friends are, what they're up to, what they're doing with their time. You hear them talking. I'm not that nosy. Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't know what they're talking about. I think yeah. Ruby makes it easy for you, but if you have, well, yes, I always will drive. You know what? I feel like you get the tea when you're driving the kids around Ooh. with your ears playing chauffeur. Oh, that's smart. Okay. Note to self parents no, self, be the driver drive. be the always driver drive. i thought it was build a pool so they'd all come over but i think this is less expensive be the driver enter the scene a 14 year old girl named heather wendorf like you said she's you know a misfit she's odd and dark like rod she's an outsider and they start hanging out And they decide that she should become a vampire like him by becoming Rod's vampire daughter. And he tells me that this is done by ritualistically drinking her blood. And his exact words are this. When you do a blood ritual, you become their sire and they become your fledgling or their progeny. So you take them as daughters. I drank enough of her that night that she actually grew pale and faint. When Rod talks about his stronghold on Heather, I can see how that happened. I mean, he's charming and he's soothing when he speaks. He's not, you can think of people controlling other people through fear like religion can. He's not like that. He's confident, but not cocky. And if you're 14 and looking to fit in and you want nothing to do with the typical high school guy, you can see how like this mysterious trench coat wearing dude could be alluring. But the danger is that young girls in the situation can become dependent on that relationship. It becomes all they have. And they end up doing things to please 
and retain the attention of a guy like Rod. That dynamic is so scary as a mom of a teenager, that control dynamic of a first boyfriend. And you don't see a future. Children at this age are not able to realize that emotions are temporary and that their high school reality is going to be over quickly. They don't see it. It feels like an eternity. They can't. I mean, everything's like life or death to the teenager. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that's their immature brain. But it's also, if you think about how time passes, time passes, relatively speaking, time passes so much slower the younger you are because it's a much larger percentage of the your life. You know, a, a year for us is nothing, but a year right. for a young person is a lot. It's a long time. This vampire lifestyle really ramped up for Rod and his misfit friends. They embodied every element of it, and it, vampirism, controlled every moment of their day. They became brazen about it. They didn't even hide it. And then one day, Rod's mother walked in on a bloodletting ritual, and his world came to a temporary halt. Let's just pause there for a second and imagine... Walking in, Rod says, she sees blood dribbling and twining down my arm with this girl's blood on our lips. She sees a guy in the corner quoting from a witch's Bible. She snapped. My mother screamed and threw a fit and expelled the other two people from the house. She's threatening me and I end up throwing my knife at her. It ended up sticking in the door frame next to her and I told her if she ever threatened me again, I would bleed her dry. He says that to me like he's reciting a grocery list, just no big deal. This calm adult in front of me had urges we will never understand. And when he's describing this to me, he's not saying, I can't believe I did this. He's like, yeah, this is what happened. I have to give her credit in a moment of brilliant parenting Sandra was like, uh-uh, nope, this is not happening. We're leaving. And she, I probably would have done the same thing. She thinks that if she moves him out of this group, she can save him. So she packs up and moves to her hometown of Murray, Kentucky. And he needs this. He needs to be shaken up and taken out of this creepy environment where he believes he's the leader of a freaking vampire family. But hang on to your hats and glasses because I barely believed it, but I did all the research and it's true. The guy moves into this tiny community, and you know what he does? He freaking finds more vampires. From what I understand, Murray is this little college town that happens to also have a lot of teenagers and even older adults interested in the occult. There was a place called the Vampire Hotel, which is where they would do their drugs and their partying. And I was like, uh-uh, no way. But it's super common. There's still vampire families all over the place. You can look it up. They're there. They have, like, Facebook pages. And I don't know. It's it's nuts. It's nuts. I, I couldn't believe it. And, but it made... I mean, it's a, it's a podcast in and of itself. But it made me realize that, you know, it was so easy to have these urban legends when we were younger and didn't have social media. But... You can really create any kind of following you want now with social media. And you can reach people everywhere. I mean, at the time, there were vampire covens all over the United States, but they didn't talk to each other. Now they do. Probably like vacation together. Vampires at Disney. <laughs> I mean, they do have the whole steam trunk punk nights at Disney. So maybe there's vampire mm -hmm. night. And it's all kind of unofficial, right? Like, all of a sudden, you're walking with your little kids and you look up and... People are wearing things that look like they came out of the haunted mansion. And that's just their normal clothing because it's an unofficial steampunk night. Think about what the steampunk folks must think about us athleisure middle-aged women <laughs> with our like Lululemon head to toe. <laughs> and we haven't worked out in weeks. With, with our giant coffees, like not working out. <laughs> Yelling at our kids, uh, cursing our husbands. I Yes. Rod's now in Murray, Kentucky, and he begins to form his own vampire family from these teens he's meeting. And he claims to me that they were not nearly as bright as him. 
make no mistake, Rod is very bright. So it didn't really surprise me that he was brighter than these kids. But he has this like glimmer in his eyes because he describes his superior maturity. And at one point he even winks at me. He actually winked at me a couple times. And he finds it really easy to manipulate his new group. And if you think about it, these are kids who probably haven't been out of Kentucky. And here he comes from Florida with his intelligence, his charm, his well-developed sense of grandiosity. And it makes it pretty easy for him to dominate his vampire family quickly. Now it's early 1996 in Murray, Kentucky, and Rod recruits three main members for his family. The first is a young girl named Charity Kesey, and she's gothic like Rod, and she's also looking to belong. You know, he has a type. And she's also into vampirism before she even meets him, so convenient. Then there is Scott Anderson, who's another high school misfit, and Dana Cooper. And she's no longer in high school, but she hasn't moved on. She's just kind of in this, like, go-nowhere job and still hanging around town. So he may have been having sex with all of them. We didn't get into that. Um, But he definitely had a very close and sexual relationship with Charity. And I asked Rod specifically about the obvious type he has and how he knew to pick the socially weak kids who were looking for somewhere to fit in. And he smirks and he says, are you asking me if I look for kids with social pariah issues? And then he goes on to say that he knew to look for kids who felt powerless and he felt he could restore their power. So I push him on that a bit and then he says, well, you know, I point out to him like, okay, great. Look at you giving back power, but That gives you power to dominate these people. And he agrees. He says by giving them his power, he got power. But then he claims to me that he had around 150 people in his cult, but they didn't actually know about each other. And obviously that's a wild exaggeration. He said that these members who are all not connected had differing interests. Some were just into the occult. Some were dealing drugs for him. And some were just there for the sex and parties. So I'm wondering if he's just like literally counting every single person he ever partied with. This guy's only 16 at the time. Anyway, as I said, he doesn't dominate them out of fear. He knows better than that. It's not his style. He gives these kids a place to belong and to count, to matter, and to be cared for in a weird way. He has this very, he's very sexual, but he has this very paternal feeling toward these girls in particular. So while Rod is hanging out in cemeteries and partying all night, he's sleeping all day and failing out of school. According to his mother, he was using cocaine and LSD all the time, and his sense of grandeur is out of control, and there is no adult who control him. And he admits this much. He says that he started to realize that he could behave any way he wanted. There simply weren't consequences. And he tells a story about a time when he was consoling a very upset young girl at school. He already admitted that he has an eye for the vulnerable. And a teacher comes up and like puts his hand on his shoulder, touched him, and said, you can't be here. Rod opens up his jacket, flashes his giant knife, and tells the teacher that he will give him a smile from ear to ear if he ever touches him again. So shockingly, Rod gets expelled, but he could not care less. I think at this point, school was just a place to be with his underlings and potentially recruit more of them. But now Rod has nothing but time. So he starts making Molotov cocktails and carrying more knives and guns oh, and axes because it's totally normal to cruise around town carrying an axe. But he did. And he's already known, well known, to law enforcement for drugs. But at this point, he also starts to have conflict with rival covens or cults or families. I struggle to know what to call them. And he admits that they are going fisticuffs. They're fighting. And he admits also to physically harming other kids. But when I ask him, he says he never killed anyone up to that point. There's no way I was going to believe these stories about the other vampire groups, but we did <laughs> Again, we we were able to corroborate that, that he was brawling with other covens. 
in Murray, Kentucky. I kind of, I want to visit one coven for a minute with a guard. It's not just vampires that I have come across. Since I met with Rod, I told you I've been like digging deeper and I have found no fewer than three members of witch covens who I just met on my own, just casually, not violent at all, just witches. And I'm like a suburban soccer mom. I'm not going to any cool clubs. I, but if you look, if you ask, if you, if you seem open to it, you'll get somebody telling you that they used to belong to a coven or still do. I'm Morgan Rector, host of the Human Monsters True Crime Podcast. Do you find life boring within the comfort zone? This is the right show for you. It will test your endurance. The offenders profiled are among the most inhumane. These people specialize in the unthinkable. Human Monsters, available wherever you get your podcasts. So, with this heavy attention from the police, Rod and the core members of his vampire family decide to leave Kentucky and head to New Orleans. They figure there, there will be more vampires, given the backdrop of Anne Rice's novels. But they're going to make a life-changing detour. Remember that Rod has his very special vampire daughter back in Florida, Heather Wendor. And when Rod tells her that he is leaving Kentucky and going to New Orleans, she begs him to come get her. She wants to go too. Here's where it gets a little dicey. According to Rod, Heather tells him that her father is unreasonably strict. And Rod says, he admits that Heather did not say that she was being abused, but Rod insists that she insinuated it. I didn't find any mention of abuse anywhere other than from Rod, but he believed she was being physically abused. Rod commits to going there and rescuing her. So he, Dana, Charity, and Scott take Scott's old giant Buick and head to Florida. And you can envision these stupid teens in this big boat of a car. And for those of you who are old enough to remember, these things like would float over speed bumps and mm-hmm. potholes. It was like... They probably all part. sat in the front row. Remember oh, how they... It was like a couch. Bench. Yes. <laughs> yeah, bench there's seating. just all four sitting across. <laughs> I'm sure they were. Plenty of room for Heather. It was like the height of luxury in the 80s and felt like you were like riding an amusement park. And some of them even had eight track players. So there's definite excitement about their adventure, but Rod wasn't okay. And this was according to everybody he was with. He was agitated. And the way they described it in the the court documents, it sounded to me that he was coming off on drugs because like the come down can be tough. I don't have any evidence of that, but they did say that he said out loud, I want to kill someone or something. And like I said, these are from court documents. But here's the thing, in that vampire family structure, he's their sire, so they can't question him. We're on this drive, and when they get close, Rod calls Heather when he's near her home. And now what I'm about to tell you next is Rod's version of this story, and it is not corroborated by Heather. Rod claims that Heather tells him on the phone that there's only one way for her to get away because her parents are never going to let her leave. And he infers that she means for him to kill her parents. So when they get to Heather's house, she meets them down the road and she stays down the road in the car with the girls, the other two girls, and only Scott and Rod go into the house and they first enter through the garage to find something to use for a weapon. Rod chooses a crowbar, and he tells me that at that moment, after he has been told or insinuated that this man is abusing Heather, that that image summoned all the rage he needed to kill this guy. Now, it's important to note that that never came up in trial. He didn't say that in trial, but he's telling me that this is how he was able to do it. He just had to picture Heather being abused. Now, Richard Wendorf is asleep on the couch. And what Rod describes next is very cinematic. He tells me that he was dancing around Robert Wendorf's sleeping body like a capering imp or elf. And Scott was watching, like, in shock. But then Rod begins beating 
Richard Wendorf with the crowbar about the face and the head to the point where he was unrecognizable. But Rod says he needed to make sure he was dead. So then he takes both hands on the crowbar, raises it up, and impales Richard Wendorf with the crowbar. He then lights a cigarette and starts looking for money. So at this point, Mrs. Wendorf comes out, and then Rod beats her to the point of severing her spinal cord. Rod tells me that he was in a state of psychosis, and he could have been given the amount of drugs he was taken. I mean, he could be in a drug-induced psychotic state. I get a lot of meth, paranoid, psychosis murders coming across my desk, but Rod also admits to me that he got a rush from these killings, like that final sensation he had always been seeking. Is Rod like mentally ill and this is like a delusion that he's in, like a fervor that he's in? He actually did claim that at the trial. It didn't work. So he would, he read, like when you're reading about somebody who thinks they are a vampire, thinks they are something they are not, paranoid schizophrenia or regular schizophrenia in general comes to mind, but he wasn't schizophrenic. Um, He could have had a psychotic break. And when you're taking that many drugs, that does happen to people. Some people can, you know, enter a level of psychosis and that could be, but he is not that I know of diagnosed with any mental disorders or many, any mental illness. The boys steal the Wendorf's SUV and they meet up with the rest of the clan. And according to others, Heather flipped out when she learned her parents were dead. But according to Rod, she didn't. And the group continues on. They leave for New Orleans. An hour later, Heather's sister comes home to find her parents brutally murdered. She calls 911. And as the group is making their way to Louisiana, these super geniuses are using the Wendorf's credit cards to buy gas and food. I mean, this was not a well thought through crime and the police have no problem finding them right away. They corner them in a hotel parking lot just three days after the murder. Rod quite boastfully confesses to the killings and the original four kids are tried as adults, but get this, A grand jury dismisses the case against Heather Wendor. And this did not sit well with everyone. There are a lot of people who are upset about this. There's a lot of dispute about whether or not Heather knew of the plans to kill her parents. So as accomplices to these brutal murders, Dana Cooper was sentenced to 17 years in prison and Charity Kesey received 10 Scott Anderson received life in prison without parole, and Rod Farrell is sentenced to death at 16 years old. And I believe he was the youngest person ever to be given the death penalty, at least at the time. But in 1999, Florida outlawed death penalty for any crime committed before the age of 17, so Rod's sentence was eventually commuted to life in prison. While Rod showed no mercy for his crimes in his interrogation tapes, which is what sealed the deal for the jury, he spoke to me about remorse now. But as we know, a psychopath learns the language of remorse as they get older. And that's one of the reasons I studied them in children before they learned to fake it. Kids will tell you all the time, oh, I don't care. But adults know that they have to use these words that make all of us feel that they, you know, have this emotion that they have no idea what we're talking about. If you try to to explain remorse, guilt, empathy to a true psychopath who hasn't learned the words of it yet. It's like explaining a a taste no one's tasted or a sense. Like if you don't hear, how would you explain to somebody what hearing is or what sight is? A, A person who can't see, you can't describe sight to someone and that's what it's like for them. There's so much to go into here, Beth, about... I know. I mean, just the remorse and teenagers and not fully understanding, like, what you're doing and, you know, just following the wrong person. I mean, Scott, just when he started, when Rod started dancing with a crowbar, that's when Scott should have stepped in and said, hey, I don't know if this is, this might be wrong. This might be wrong. And I think if, I think, I'm not sure, you know, I mean, juries do what juries do and it's not consistent but i would think if scott had like been like oh i gotta use the bathroom and ran in and called the police like, when they're even on the road trip like even after they did it if he had if any of them really 
had called and said, we are with a murdering vampire, come get us. I think they would have all gotten off a little easier than they did, except for him, except for Rod. But I mean, let's talk about that. Teens are so ripe for this type of persuasion and fantasy. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're already Mm -hmm. having existential crises and they want to be independent, but they don't want to stand alone. Right. And I think that is where they kind of fall into these traps is, you know, did your mom ever say to you, well, if so-and-so would jump off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge? You and mean I my feel mom like, didn't invent that saying? I thought she invented I know. that. <laughs> well, I think that's where like teens sometimes like kind of get themselves into trouble is, is one person's doing something. And then, you know, I think nowadays it's a lot harder for kids to stand up for themselves because mm-hmm. of the social media pressure. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause they don't want, you know, this mastermind to turn the whole crew against them. And then they'll really be alone. I mean, that's such a motivating And they have that incredible need to belong. Like, I mean, we all kind of do, but it's really at its its height when you're a teenager, right? I mean, you've got Well, also their mind isn't like fully developed to know, they're just starting the critical thinking, you know, where right, right I mean, they know right from wrong and hopefully they're raised with a good moral code. But I think that sometimes if they're not willing to question authority or question, you know, people, then they can really be led the wrong way or led astray. You're absolutely right. And combine that, that immature brain with sensation seeking, risk taking and mm-hmm. absent parenting. And you get this perfect oh, yeah. storm. And drugs, of course, always the father of bad decisions. Always the father. Ooh, I'm going to use that one. Oh, and, drugs? And here's they're just the, evil. <laughs> always the father of bad decisions. Also, they kill you now all the time. Oh, like, yeah, all the time. I mean, they don't mess the around. It's like you the dark side in Star Wars. I mean, it's just... It, yeah, it's a whole different program now doing drugs. Like, you can't. You just can't because you might be dead the first time because there's fentanyl in it. And especially if you're a careless teenager and you trust your friends who just got that Percocet off of Snapchat and it has fentanyl in it and you don't know it and you're dead. Like, it's... It, there's no... The stakes are too high now to do drugs, period. Then that's your last PSA from this podcast. I really do need them to bring the after school specials back. You know, I, know. I feel like everything we're talking about. They have, we have yeah. to have them back because that's where I got my moral compass. Yes. From there. Yes. Yeah. They'll be like, don't date vampires. That would be one yes. episode. Do not take the Percocet off of Snapchat. Right. That'd be episode two. We need to call yes. somebody, somebody with important yeah. decision maker. The teens, they're in this difficult position because they feel like they're adults and they look like adults, but their brains are woefully immature. And it's a really painful transition from childhood to adulthood. And it is so much slower than we think. And in some cases for boys, they're saying up to 25, 26 years old before they have complete brain maturation. Like that's with that for a minute. Yeah. Well, also, I think if you add the complication of the tidal wave of emotions that kind of come in and trying to surf those along with the confusing, like, role in the world, you know, absolutely, it can really make things hard to decipher, you know, absolutely. So they're emotional. They don't know that they won't always be. They don't know that this changes. You can tell them like these hormones, you you know, just like they ramp up hormones, ramp up puberty. And, you know, now on the other side of it, they they start declining for menopause. But you can tell a teenager that they're not always going to feel this depressed. They're not always going to feel this lonely. They're not always. But they don't they don't know. They don't know that they won't. And, you know, they're also they're intellectually curious and they can become righteous truth seekers, crusaders. Like, think about how righteous you are when you go off to college and how you're just like, the world's really fucked up and I'm going to change it. And before you become jaded and realize nothing you do matters, before you get there, you don't have the maturity to truly understand the difference between truth and illusion. They just don't have the benefit of experience or a fully formed brain, really. You know, and so you, you you're you're just more susceptible to something like vampirism. And it's the dopamine release that you get from it. And you can convince yourself it's morally sound. And now, not only do they have to worry about sensational sensationalism in the news, they also have to worry about where, I mean, TikTok is probably their largest news source, right? Everybody has a platform. So Moon Juice can tell you that you need to just drink this supplement and worship the stars and you're going to everybody gets to have an opinion and everybody's an expert. 
Right. Well, the big challenge with uh, TikTok being a source of information is uh, once you start liking certain things, the algorithm starts introducing more of the same thing, and then you get lost in the echo chamber. It's so um, dangerous, I, I'd say, the echo chamber. Critical thinking is that's like that's what we'd want to achieve. It's what everybody needs to like we are we are so mired in confirmation bias we're so mired in i want this vampirism to be true so i'm going to take every sign of it to be true and i'm there's no need for me to think critically about this i don't want to be wrong and it's not just teens do it like you're saying like everyone loves an echo chamber because they feel like you 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 have to stop trusting yourself when you're no longer curious about new information, when you just want more confirmation. And I think for teens, that they're definitely not there yet, where they want, oh, okay, so I'm, I'm feeling this way, I'm, I see this evidence for this. Is there any evidence against it? They don't look for that. They're just looking, I mean, to be right. Right. And to fit in. And TikTok's right about, you know, whatever that smoothie was or goddess dip. So, of course, it's going to be right about my life choices. And it's so t- hard as, as a because it's tempting to step away from parenting while your teenagers are begging for freedom and they're rebelling and rebelling and you're tired of the damn fight you know and they they look like adults they have hormones and urges and they're as big as you and you know you can't see their brain but it's really immature and it's it's easy to be fooled into like okay i need i need to back back away but really it's when you kind of have to lean in the most Right. Like, well, I think there's a difference between like you backing away and giving space to sort out, and yes. let, like where that fine line is, I have no idea. It's basically like trying to make a souffle and then like doing jumping jacks in front of the oven. Either it's going to rise or fall. You know, sometimes you have to like <laughs> back away for the oven to let the souffle rise. You know, you can't. I've I don't know. That's how souffle, I try to. But <laughs> this is also going to be a cooking podcast. And Rod said that he had to seek out sensations to because he needed to feel and he was willing to go the distance to do it. So if you have one of these sensation seekers on your hands, and by the way, there's a lot of teenage sensation seekers, plus they have grandiose ideas to believe that they are or could be more powerful than the rest. And then, you know, they have their underdeveloped brain. You can end up with a rod on your hands, you know? I mean, you and I were, were more likely to worry about our kids falling under the influence of a Rod Farrell, but the Rod Farrells of the world, their parents need to be like, whoa, okay, what is my kid doing to other children? And we spend a lot of time, and I think it's important fortifying kids to not fall in, into this kind of a trap, but we need to also address the parents who are raising a Rod Farrell. You know, it's well, like- Well, would the kids show signs of being a mastermind at a young age? Well, like- I think I think they do. And I think if you see- the manipulation. I mean, we've all been in the presence of one of these really manipulative kids and they're brilliant and genius. But as they become bigger and you have less control of them and you have somebody like Rod who's like, F you, I'm doing drugs in your house. I'm having orgies and bloodletting in your house. Like you have to lean in. And even if that means your kid has to be sent away for a minute, like we've talked a lot about these programs available for very rebellious kids or kids who do not respond to consequence and it would be very hard to do that it would be very hard to trust your child with somebody else but if you've lost control of your kid you can't just like you know brush your hands off and be like okay well he's almost an adult now because rod farrell was not an adult at 16 or 18 i mean he's i think he's i mean we all know we've all but don't you also know the parent whose kid can do no wrong even when they are the mastermind I do. I do. I mean, that's the real hard. I don't know what the word is for a parent whose kid does no wrong. I have like that opposite that's the problem of that. Like, I blame my kids for everything. <laughs> You've never had it, something where your kid got in trouble and your kid says, uh, well, so-and-so told me to do it. And then you mm. call that parent and they're like, well, my kid didn't do that. And I'm like, well, why don't you check with your kid? And then they call you back and be like, okay, I'm sorry. My kid totally did do that. No, mm-mm. my kids are good about owning their, their, I mean, I think Charlotte is proud of her naughtiness. Um, she doesn't, they're not rule breakers. They're, they're, they do things to be funny. They're not, but they're really little still, like, you know, they're only eight and 11, but there, there are some moms who I think it's more challenging for them to see where their kids are participating. 
And truly, there is the gift of letting children work stuff out on their own. They need to learn the skill so they can bring it forward. But you have to be, you have to recognize we tie up a lot of our identity in the outcome of our children. And we need to remember some of that is wildly out of our control. I mean, if you've learned anything in this podcast, you've learned that so much of it is predestined. Whether we, I don't like that either, but it does eliminate a little bit of pressure. Also understanding like, your lack of control as a parent i don't know it's just all of it's uncontrollable and i think sometimes if you surrender too much i don't know it's it's like you you don't control anything so how do you control like because you can't expect to control another human no you cannot and you have to be manipulative yourself right so like let's say we can control 11 percent of a teenager because it's probably something like that you have to make sure that a your 11 percent is good but b remember the influence of peers increases as a child ages and that's mathematically measured and your influence is almost zilch by the time your your kid's a teen and i i hated reading it i hated reading all the studies indicating it but what you can do is influence their peers like where is your child going to school who are they hanging out with that you have some control over so while your direct parenting is becoming minimized in its efficacy you can make sure you're supporting the right environment outside the home and it's hard to do i mean it's resources i mean maybe you can't move you know she was able to she made the right move she did the right thing how Mm -hmm. was she to know that there was vampires everywhere i know oh my gosh but to your to the extent that you can you and we all know it's intuitive that peers matter a lot to a teenager um, but it's it's more than we even think. It's it, it's shocking the studies showing how the parenting effects mathematically drop down to almost zero at this point. And but I'm like, okay, but the, let's get around that. Let's pick the peers to the extent we can, right? I mean, a well, rebel's going to find kind of, her. I'm, a, I'm split on that because I don't think that you can socially engineer your kids too much because they do have to kind of like find their own group. But I do think you can like sign them up for violin or golf or whatever you perceive to be a better future um, or a better environment or group. And I think, of course, you can't pick your friends for them, but you can pick. I mean, if it means going to a hippie charter school, there are so many more options today than there were when we were Mm -hmm. kids. You went to, you know, private school, you went to Catholic school, parochial school, or you went to public school. Now it's like, you you can even have i mean there's online schools there are so and there's many homeschooling more. yeah mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and i hate to say that like swoop in and move your kid and pull them out but when they get too far gone you kind of just you remove you you do what you have to do i mean we used to be you get sent to like military school and those can have really right. deleterious effects but now there are professionals who who work exactly with this type of kid um, oh really? Like the uh-huh. mastermind kid? They uh-huh. kind of swoop in and be like, "I'm going to deprogram your mm-hmm. your mastermind." Yeah, yeah. So I mean, again, this is an issue of privilege. You know, it's an issue of it's an issue of finances, and there mm-hmm. are programs that you can get your kid into. Um, you know, Rod needed to probably be medicated. He needed psychiatric help. He needed he needed a place guidance guidance and he needed to understand he wasn't i mean the grandiosity is it's it's just in you but he needed to understand that he could use that more positively than he was and um you know it's it's tough if you end up with a kid like rod and she wasn't very old herself you know sandra right and i and it, she might not have been like worldly enough to know other things to consume his time with to like exactly. keep his intellectual curiosity on the uh positive side of things yeah. And not turning to the dark side of vampirism. And because that is a very layered, interesting, deep culture, there's a lot of literature. And he obviously, he's very intelligent. Yeah. And so there was just a lot of stuff for his intelligent mind to consume. You know, Absolutely. and she probably was like, oh, great, he's reading. Oh, great, he's quiet. Yeah. And, and, and not knowing that it's vampirism, you know? And, and again, you know, I'm looking at this in hindsight. It, it, he might have looked a lot like other loner teenagers. You know, and it doesn't mean that the trajectory is going to be murder. You're not thinking that. But once you see bloodletting happening in your house, then then you do what she did. And you, 
you figure out a way to, to control this. And for the kids who are under his influence, like these kids were loners, they were misfits. You know, I'm not, I don't know what kind of homes they came from, but if your child is struggling to fit in and they're not happy about that, some kids want to be on their own. Some kids like it, right? Like some kids don't need the group, but just being on top of it, there's not much you can do as we know. I mean, yes, your kids can be in therapy and you can move their schools and you can do everything, but just make sure that that void, don't don't back away at that point. Like as much as you're saying, and I agree that you have to give them agency and ability to figure their own stuff out. And they have to, otherwise they go off to college and they have no skills. You also have to make sure that they're not on that third rail and they're, you know, I mean, it could end in like this. Would you agree that when you were, different when we were kids you were ostracized more like when we were little and somebody wore clothes that were different than ours or they they ended up like neighing like horses all the time because they were into horses we were relentlessly cruel and that's not okay like being a bully is not okay anymore in school at least from what i've seen like they don't get away with that as much as they did, I'd say, back. I mean, maybe, I mean, this is anecdotal. I mean, these are available heuristics. I don't know if it's true across the board. But I feel like there's, um, you're not allowed to be a, a shitty little kid as much as you were allowed when we were kids. Like the things that we used to, not me in particular, I don't think I was particularly mean, but I feel like the kids would be ostracized and bullied all day. Same kids all day growing up. And I don't think they get away with that now. I hope. I went to public school in the 80s, 90s. So there wasn't as much tolerance for that when I was mm. um, in uh, high school and grade school. But my kids go to private school and there's not that same kind of bullying. But I don't think that they have as big of a handle. Like I feel like in the 80s, like you would get called down to the office and your parents would get called and they would like sit all four of you in the room and be super uncomfortable and you'd all be in trouble. I don't think they do that as much in the private schools. I think they try to keep more peace. See, this so is why it's so like good that. to have you on or other people on because I rely so much on my own experience and that's so bad. No, like, I think that they would try to like, I mean, they, ha they have to go through exercises and like, but it's more because my kids go to a private school, it's like through a Christian filter. Uh -huh. And, but not, but not Catholic parochial, which was very different, you know, but it is like, I think they have like a very different approach to handling these kinds of sub situations yeah. where they have to like write a letter about what they did. They have to like talk about the impact on the other person and be like more sensitive about it. You know, sometimes they don't fully understand like the broader context if they get in trouble for saying something, sometimes they don't even really know what that means. But they repeated something that they heard from a friend. And I was telling my girls, it's not, you know, it's never the first person that does something that gets in trouble. It's the second and the third, you know, so you don't want to be following misinformation or saying, repeating something that you heard out of context and not fully understanding what all that means. It is so difficult to explain to daughters, and I say daughters as it happens more with girls, ab about the dangers of gossiping because we oh, still do yes. it as adults. Well, you want to do like red flags for parents when their kids are starting to get into a cult is like, you know, vamp you know, figuring out which cult it is, one. And, uh, you know, if you start seeing your kid like getting really pear and vampire-y, you know? Yeah. And they start like, Dressing differently, having different group of right. friends, um, wearing, you know, jewelry they never would have worn before, listening to music. Yeah, kids are looking for their identity, but if it's going off the rails a bit mm -hmm. and they're becoming more secretive and spending less time at home. And then that's when you start inviting all the friends over and stuff like that. Or let them listen to this podcast. Let them know about yeah. Ron Farrell. Let them know about, like, you might end up killing us. But but also, I think one thing for parents is to, like, learn how to let their kids make decisions at a young age, knowing that if your kid's having strong opinions, making them sure that they can make choices, Yeah, whatever absolutely. those choices may be. When I was looking on that subculture site and I was just going through all the different subcultures between vampirism and, and then there was another one and there was just all these going down the rabbit hole. I was like, oh, my God, there's so many things that I forgot to worry about. <laughs> 
Well, and sometimes it's just kind of nice to not know what you don't know because it's really traumatizing when you realize that there are so many things uh, that you need to worry about at every stage of a child's development. And yeah, I'm trying to make the data, the research palatable for everybody right. where it's not boring. When you pick up a, a research book or an article, it's hard, it's hard to get through it. But the goal for me is like, this information's out there. I don't know why it's not being released by the ivory tower. I mean, it is on, on occasion, but it needs to be interpreted in a way that sounds so boring. And that's my goal here. But but then again, it's also like, am I just creating a generation of really paranoid parents? Because, I mean, if people are paranoid about absolutely everything, that can't be good either. <laughs> right. Well, there was a few interesting things that you said about Rod that I think, like, across the board, if you see these, are worrisome. Like, mm-hmm. his schmarminess, like, got, like, thinking he's God's gift. And the winking. I yeah, mean, he did wink a lot. If somebody comes to pick up your daughter and they're smarmy and winking in odd ways, like yeah. flirting with adults, winking, all of yeah. those are kind of like, ooh, red flags, you know? And consoling and like taking over and parenting, you know, like there's a lot that goes on and I don't know what was visible, but, you know, it's, we always knew the parents who kind of weren't present because those are the houses we'd go to, Right. That's Mm -hmm. like, you know, as you got older, it's like, oh, so-and-so's parents are never home or so-and-so's parents don't come out of their room. They don't care what we do. I mean, my immediate group friends know, like yours, mom, everybody's mom, like they were all, you know, they knew exactly what we were doing. But you always knew those parents who were busy or doing their other lives. And they worked all the time. I don't know if you guys had that. I mean, we had a lot of that in the Northeast. It's like parents that were always working. They're just working, right? And like, you have to be aware. Like, I remember at uh, a school function once, my my a man I work with said, they said, "Look around. Who are the cool parents?" And everyone's like, "Oh, kind of like, oh, me or not me." And he's like, "Yeah, see those cool parents? That's where your kid's gonna go to drink." And everyone's like putting their hands down, like, but it's true. Like the parents who want yeah. to either duck out of parenting because they're over it because the kids are difficult teenagers, or the parents who want to just be liked. You right. Know, they want to be buddies. How many siblings did you have? I know you had a bunch. Yeah, I'm one of four. I'm the third of four. four. The third of four, okay. Yeah, so my older brother and sister are still alive in New Jersey. And I don't, you remember my younger brother passed away when I we got out of college. Yeah. You know, those moments, like losing a sibling, it's just not, you're not supposed to. And, you know, I don't, mm-hmm. now that you're a parent, you probably see what your parents went through differently. Maybe well, I, I think it just like broke them in a way that wasn't, um, you know, they still had each other, but it just like they're just forever changed. I think we were all very forever changed. You're never the and same. Then, yeah, yeah, and I think as an adult, um, you know, you expect uh, you get like future mourning. You know, like mm. you mourn the loss, but then you start mourning the future without them. And I bet it's not easier now. No. Like it's just different. No, I mean it is different, and I think you have to give yourself some grace to allow it to be different. But I think you have to like give yourself some flexibility in changing together. If that makes sense, changing it up a little bit. Is it guilt that makes people want to keep it all the same? Like if I change it? I think it's just, yeah, I think part of it, if I change it, it will be like that. Or I also think that like, just nobody knows what to do. There's no Mm. like right or wrong way to do something. And so when you don't know, you're like, well, this is how I've always done it. And this is what I'm comfortable with. But like, my whole life feels really uncomfortable. So I don't know what else to Mm -hmm. do. You know, you you go through all these things that are supposed to make you feel really good, but they don't because there's, they don't because you're looking in the mirror. There's no reflection, you know, and what do you, you can't (sighs) like cook something to make that reflection come back. You can't, there's, there's really nothing. You just have to like live with the emptiness. You you just have to find a way to live with that. Like Mm -hmm. you just, it's just part of you now. This, this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the big trap is like not filling that void with fanaticism, alcoholism, drug addiction, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. or like I can a, see how it happens. Yeah. Or like a dominant personality. I mean, I feel like those are all kind of the traps that you can fall into. But I do think that these are the kind of things that lead people astray and down into the dark mm-hmm. hole of fanaticism, trying to fill that hole. You know, you're talking about a void that can be caused by a major trauma like death of a loved one, in your case mm-hmm. a sibling. 
I could see at 22 years old, some kids just diving into drinking, like you're saying. Like I think for me, I dove right into work. I think I like quickly kind of became a workaholic and I was like very into my like big agency life. You know, that mm. was like kind of, a, you know, remember my suits and my mm -hmm. neckerchiefs and oh, so cute. <laughs> I was really, I mean, I think that was my fanaticism for a long time to deal with it was diving into the big world of uh, New York advertising. And I think that, you know, um, it was a good place to hide behind instead of like dealing with all the, the pain of loss. So while I had a productive fanaticism with work, you know, these teenagers had a very unproductive fanaticism with vampirism. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, know? you can see it's like, fill the void, as you said, like, I, yeah. I don't want to sit in this grief anymore. So I'm going to do this other thing. Yeah, I'm just going to go get busy. Thank you, Beth. Let's be in touch. All right, absolutely. Bye-bye. This has been How Not to Raise a Serial Killer, and we will see you soon. How Not to Raise a Serial Killer is a Cloud 10 Media production, executive produced by me, Dr. Michelle Ward, and Sim Sarna. Our editor is Emily Crane. Our music was created by Josh Cook, with artwork provided by Brian Stefanik. Follow us on Instagram at How Not to Raise a Serial Killer, and on TikTok and Twitter at Hentrask. That's at H-N-T-R-A-S-K. And if you'd like to share a story or ask a question, you can email us at hownottoraiseaserialkiller at gmail.com. If you like our show, do me a favor and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. After all, if more people know about the show, maybe fewer kids will turn into serial killers. Who knows? Thanks so much for listening. See you next week.